this one bad dentist made the entire industry look bad because it was a betrayal of trust. Hi, you're listening to Good Is In The Details. I am your host, Gwendolyn Dolsky, and guest hosting with me today is the pod's resident political advocacy expert. He's the organizing director for California Yimby. That means yes in my backyard, Constantine Hatcher. Hey, how we doing? We're doing good. So I read this article in The Atlantic. It's about dentistry. It's called The Truth About Dentistry. It's much less scientific and more prone to gratuitous procedures than you may think. So you know what I thought? What did you think? I have some questions. Oh, snap. So you know what I did? What did you do? I invited a dentist onto the show. Boom. (laughs) And welcome to the show, Dr. Jennifer Vitez. Hey, guys. (laughs) Oh, and you may call me Jenny V. Or Jenny. (laughs) Jenny V. Also, she has a fabulous Instagram, at Jenny V underscore DMD. Oh, you're most kind. Jenny V. Well, her, her Instagram is great because she's also, well, you've been putting stuff up about Pride, oh. like Pride Month lately. I so have. Nice. I did because for five years of my career, I've been practicing for nine years, has been with a predominantly LGBT patient population because I was serving predominantly HIV positive patients. Oh, oh wow. wow. That's yep. dope. Wait a minute. Let's start there. Okay. <laughs> how did that, na- how did your career navigate in that direction? Okay, well, I had worked for nearly three years in my first job in Bakersfield, California, after I graduated from Boston University. Well, I'm originally from, well, not originally, originally from Los Angeles County, but I grew up in Los Angeles County. I wanted to come back. And that was a job where they were opening up this facility that was funded by the Ryan White Grant. It's a federal grant that is provided to communities that have relatively high populations of HIV positive patients. And I actually have a background in treating HIV patients when I was a dental student because we not only received grant funding, but I just, by luck and happenstance, I got a lot of patients who were medically complicated. Wow. Wow, that's interesting. Now, did you say you went to Boston University Dental School? Correct. I've been treated by at Boston University Dental School because I went to BU. I started undergraduate at Boston U. No kidding. So you had the dental plan then as a student. I went there. Well, actually, I don't know if I did. I... (laughs) I'm not sure I, exactly how that worked. I kind of went in. It was just super cheap. And I was, but also, I was like 20 years old, so I knew nothing back then. I wanted to talk about this article. One mm-hmm. of the biggest questions that I have as I was reading it was that the article, and I'll put it in the show notes for those of you who are interested in reading it, but I was interested in the way in which this article starts out by talking about, let's say, a rogue dentist, somebody who is unethical. And from that description of what he did, doing too many root canals, um, just over-treating, that the article takes this leap to describe dentistry as a whole. And that made me a little bit uncomfortable as I was reading it. Uh, there was a part of me that was thinking, this was really about Lund. Was that his name? Oh, yeah. Correct. Roger Lund. Okay, Roger Lund. So as I'm reading it, I'm thinking, this is about a terrible person who is a dentist for a living. And the way in which he handled that profession was an expression of his character. And this interests me because in philosophy, when we talk about what does it mean to live life well, what does it mean to be good? Some philosophers like Immanuel Kant say that a good will is more important than let's say talent. Because if you don't have a good core, then the talent doesn't matter. And that's what I was thinking about. So now that I have you, what was your impression about this? Did you read this and think, not again, or I've heard this before, or there was some new critique? What was your impression from this? And that's an excellent question. I would start I would start by saying that when I read the article, and I've read it at least three times at this point, including okay. the past two days, that it almost started and ended exactly like a typical article from my liability insurance company. That's TDIC, the dental insurance company. And P.S. I love TDIC. Thank you guys for excellent coverage and also legal <laughs> advice when I've needed it. Take what you will from that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I might have a question about that later. (laughs) But back to that, though, um, what is excellent about TDIC is that it has these excellent articles where they talk about true stories of dentists who have been in this kind of situation, where in in practice acquisition, where um, someone decides to buy somebody out, inherit not only the location, the equipment, but also what we call the goodwill, the patients who are, are part of that practice, they have to know what they're getting themselves into. So initially, the article is actually very well written in that aspect of, well, they're dissecting a scenario where a dentist who bought this practice discovers the worst thing possible. 
Yeah. And then wondering what he could possibly do about it. And thankfully, he actually does do the right thing by doing the right, doing right by the patients and then taking this unfortunate dentist to court. But the problem was is that it delved exactly like you said, where instead of vilifying this one dentist who had done wrong by his patients, when if you put him in any sort of other industry, say like if he was an electrician, he probably would have been overcharging his clients by saying they just needed to re-gut and uh, reconstruct and having to add new wiring instead of having to just fix that single problem. I think he would have just done something ethically in any other industry. Instead, he vilified my entire industry. Right. And to me, that was way too grossly generalized a conclusion to take. But at the same time, it did open up the discussion of whether or not we should re-look at whether or not everybody in my industry is actually practicing evidence-based dentistry or really are they doing something else? Well, something that I learned from this article that I didn't know before was this separation between that there were these two camps, which I was not aware of when it came to medicine versus dentistry. That's the way that it seemed to set up, almost like there was a, a rivalry or what's going on. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that because to me, it seems like there's a saying, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And I'm, there's a part of me that's wondering if that can't apply to when somebody is looking in somebody's mouth. You can actually recognize a lot about their overall health. And to minimize the significance of that does not seem like a good idea. There's several layers into that question. Okay. First off is dentistry itself as an industry, as well as it trying to run in parallel to medicine. Dentistry, I would say, is very akin to surgery. Surgery was only considered a part of medicine within the past 100 years. Mm -hmm. And dentistry has only probably been an integral part of medicine probably even less than 100 years. And it was because surgeons of any kind, whether it's going to be medical or dental, used to be part of an apprenticeship like a practice versus in medicine where you would have to go through proper higher education. So that's where there is the initial disconnect. And I think the second also comes from because stemming from that, the general public tends to think that there's this disconnect between the teeth and the rest of the body. But also you bring up the excellent point of whether or not treatment itself should be standardized across the board. Well, everybody is their own individual person based off of everything from their genetics, their sex and gender, their racial or ethnic background, the things that make them Age, unique. Age, lifestyle. I mean, exactly. I, I was not understanding the scrutiny attached to dentistry that it doesn't seem like with anybody in the medical profession would take into account how could you give the exact same treatment to every single person when every single person is different? I think one thing about the article that I think it doesn't connect or leaves out is that, you know, you have bad actors in many different, you know, the people that you have the, the great doctors and the terrible doctors. I was came to mind was the Dr. Death podcast. I was thinking the same thing. I don't know if you've seen. So it's about this guy that was like always. The back surgeon. He was a back surgeon and spine surgeon, and he was mediocre all the way through his education, became a surgeon, and was literally killing people on the table. I mean, and he would somehow manage to slip through for over a decade, right, of giving surgery. I mean, it was yeah. a period of time where several people were basically maimed by the surgeon, and what it highlighted was, well, one, that one bad actor can cause so much damage, and it doesn't mean that... But and very similarly, it was a great doctor that actually championed, was so outraged by this that he didn't let it, that he's the one that kind of championed this guy being kind of brought to justice and he ended up getting, going to jail. But, you know, so I just think it's... it's well, it's, with the Doctor so, Death, I was thinking of the Doctor Death podcast as well, which mm -hmm. you've got to listen to. It's so good. But there is no way that they made a leap between saying this Dr. Death guy to no. talking about all back surgeons. Right. As opposed to this article starts talking about a rogue dentist mm -hmm. and then makes the leap to talk about dentistry. Right. I think You wouldn't do that with any other profession. That's what I was thinking. No, I think so too. I think so too. But I think the, uh, what I found similar, I think the, what I took away from the Dr. Death piece is that these issues, when, you, when everyone's good and working in the best interest and really doing, you know, like clearly... Dr. Jenny is 
a great dentist and she's, you know, and we'll, and we'll talk a lot. And I, I don't think we've had a chance to talk about just the, that kind of what that disconnect, you know, the really connecting with the holistic approach where mm-hmm. dentistry is part of medicine is that it's that one bad actor that highlights the holes in like the oversight. And, that, and obviously I'm an advocacy guy. So that's what I work in is like, mm-hmm. how do we plug holes where so to help make sure that bad actors can't have a negative effect on the entire industry? Right, where because it's like that one bad apple that can spoil the whole bunch, right? Mm-hmm. As we were talking about earlier, right? And then so I, I yeah. was wondering, you know, that that was just something that the, I like that. What, what's a solution when you see something like this? What's the solution that comes to your mind? Well, I think first off is having to be able to educate. I think the most paramount, most important part of healthcare, period, comes from education because it doesn't matter at the end of the day, whether or not I do a good job. I also have to be able to explain to a patient, okay, here's what's going on. What is their diagnosis? How do I know that they have this diagnosis? Well, based off of that, as well as what their needs are, which I have to make sure I actually do acknowledge their needs because what they may think is important is probably different from what I'm going to think is important. And then I can determine from all that, combined with my expertise and what I have learned from continuing education courses I would take in order to keep my license and also to let me learn something that's new or innovative. That's how I can come up with a plan. That is to me, that's important because if I don't be able, if I'm not able to educate my patient, then what is the point of what I'm doing? Because Mm -hmm. not only can I not convince my patient or explain to them why I've come to this conclusion, but by the time that I'm done with the work, I want to make sure that they're able to maintain it. Or I want them to know that they have free will, that they are able to make a choice or they can choose not to do what I ask them to do or what what I recommend. And that I think is the most important thing of all, because it's still, to me, I think a lot of why, like Constantine, like you said, this idea of one rotten apple had basically spoiled the entire bunch, I think comes from that disconnect of where dentistry is still considered an outlier somehow the rest of healthcare. But the way my education was as a DMD is that dentistry is also very integral to not only medicine, but even optometry and podiatry as well. Wow. So like an example of that is I used to, in the same job where I was treating um, my predominantly HIV positive patient population, uh, I was a um, clinical adjunct faculty for Western University. That's a school in Pomona that is a purely uh, healthcare school. So they have a veterinary school, a nursing school, podiatry, optometry, medicine, and dentistry. And what they do is multidisciplinary care where they actually make sure that one patient doesn't just go to one disciplinary area. So if a patient's diabetic, they don't just see an MD. They make sure because di- because diabetes can influence the gums, it can influence your eyes because it's the number one cause to this day of blindness. Mm-hmm. And it's also a major cause of amputation, the loss of feet. Wow. So that's when a patient actually is taking care of all those aspects. So it's making sure that the public knows that your teeth are attached to the rest of your body. So right. the, mm-hmm. if your teeth are taken care of, it should impact other areas or vice versa. That because you have a certain health condition, that you have a certain behavior that you do on a regular basis, it somehow can influence it. What is another example of, it was mentioned in this article, it was only given one paragraph about the significance of dentistry um, in terms of telling about somebody's overall health. When I was taught the three functions of teeth, for one, you need to be able to eat. Two, you need to be able to talk. Three, you need it for self-esteem. Okay. And your teeth have a lot to deal with all three of them. Not to mention the fourth is because everything's connected. You want to make sure that if a tooth becomes infected, that doesn't travel to any other part of the body. Well, see, I heard that it could have to do with the cardiovascular health. There is a connection, although some... I'm the type of where I'll, I'll use the example of the editor in chief of JADA, the Journal for the American Dental Association, where he's a strong opponent of the concept of causality. Okay. Meaning that there is a connection between cardiovascular disease and issues in the mouth, like tooth decay. But at the same time, though, or um, specifically gum disease. 
But it's not that neglecting your gums is going to cause you to have cardiovascular problems. Mm. So, it reveals that there's maybe a problem, right? Correct. Okay. There was there was actual research that showed that the plaque that is found in the arteries that cause clogged arteries, atherosclerosis, is very akin to the kind of plaque that is found inside the mouth on teeth. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one can cause the other, but it's that a great percentage of patients who have cardiovascular disease also have gum issues. Okay, that's interesting. I just want to ask you, why did you become a dentist? Because the way in which this is laid out is that it just sounds like people wanting to scam people for money. And there was only a few lines to the righteous person who ended up taking the rogue dentist to court who says, I got into this for health. So I'm just curious, what made you want to go into dentistry? Well, for starters, my I, my mother was a nurse. She retired, sadly, because at the time she was uh, during the 90s, she had a very bad allergic to, allergy to latex. And there was no alternative at the time that was <sighs> prevalent enough for her to be able to use. So I always had this interest in healthcare, and I actually pursued medicine at first. And I was always good with my hands. I used to um, illustrate a lot. I used to make jewelry by wire wrapping. I played video games. But I never put the two together to think that I could do something else with it. So I have, um, so my uncle who practices dentistry in Hong Kong, he put two and two together and thought, well, Jenny, why don't you consider dentistry? And at first I kind of thought skeptically and like, it'll be a cold day in Hellwood before I'll ever consider this. Mm -hmm. But he was a very generous, he is a very generous man. He invited me when his older daughter, my cousin, uh, who's now a periodontist, a specialist of gum health, she matriculated and started her seven-year accelerated program at UPenn. And he invited me to his alma mater, their dental school, UPenn, and let me actually try out a simulation on how to remove decay, what we call to prepare a tooth, on a mannequin. So I did that simulation. And the proctor who was actually supervising me and teaching me how to use this dent sim, as we call it, not only was really kind and patient with me, but she said I actually did quite well, if not comparable or better than most of their first year students. And I thought, this is pretty damn fun. Mm -hmm. wow. And instead of pursuing medicine, like I initially was thinking, I thought, you know what? There's probably something to this. And I enjoy it because it's a combination of my interest in healthcare to be able to provide health to people and especially at the same time something that's very beautiful and unique about dentistry unlike medicine is that you can have your patients leave with instant gratification right. they can come in with the problem they can leave with the problem solved okay and that's unique for medicine because a lot of medicine does require unfortunately that things have to take effect that a patient has to heal after a major surgery or they have to be prescribed a medication to see if it takes effect. Or maybe they have to be referred for something like physical therapy and then see through that progression if it changes. Whereas in dentistry, if a patient has a cracked tooth, I have to numb them, put a filling in, mm -hmm. they can leave and they clearly see that there's a difference. That And it's a very nice thing to be able to help people like this aware they either are in pain, they have suffering, and I can make their lives better. Right. It's like dentistry and, and the other medical fields similar to theater in that live theater is great because you get to see that instant gratification of the audience. Whereas oh. if you do TV or film, you take a bunch of shots, edit it together. It might come out several months to a year later, and then you're like, oh, people actually enjoyed it. But... So much is lost in that just that initial gratification, right? That all oh, that you really get to feed off the audience. You know, if you did well, you know, when your patients leave, you help them, and that's something amazing about that. I like that analogy because, yeah, and and you bring up a good point because with theater, you're on the spot really with having to perform versus with film or television, you have the chance and opportunity to take multiple takes. But it, yeah. I'm, that's kind of in, in kind of akin to the same thing with the beauty of dentistry is that the vast majority of the treatment that I would be able to provide, as well as many of my colleagues, you can see that there's a difference very instantly as soon as a patient leaves the office. There are some things, though, similar to, like, say, uh, implant surgery, for instance, where it does take its time. It's to be expected, where there's a lot more healing involved. But the vast majority of it, though, there is, a, thankfully, that instant gratification. So I'm seeing it in the article and I'm hearing it also in you that you are making this distinction between dentistry and medicine. When you say medicine, I wanted to practice medicine, but then I decided to go into dentistry. 
what is that difference? Isn't dentistry a branch of medicine? So I must not know the definition of medicine. Again, it was that history of having them being separated. Like surgeons, which I thought was really interesting. But so... And I'm going to probably confuse you even more. Okay. Because the the word dentistry in itself, you initially think if you break it down to its word origin, if you're going to think Greek-like and thinking where word origins are, it's dentistry only focuses on the teeth. But actually... Dentistry is meant to be for the diagnosis and treatment and the maintenance of conditions of the head and the neck. Wow. See, we usually think, mo- most of us think, most laymen think that dentists really deal with just the teeth, but really we also deal with the gums, what attaches the teeth to the rest of the body. Mm-hmm. But also there are more things than just your teeth and your gums inside your mouth. You have the roof of the mouth, you have the throat, you have the tongue, you have the cheeks, all the muscles attach everything, the skin even, the lips. Yeah. Everything surrounding these areas we do have to check for. In fact, tooth decay and gum disease are the two major diseases that we are looking for, the two most common ones of the head and the neck that we as dentists are designed to treat. But then we also look for oral cancer. That's a major one that we also look for, but most tend to either not realize it or underappreciate. Okay. But what is medicine then? If that's not... What is medicine? So if somebody says they're studying medicine, then I'm wondering what is the definition of medicine to mean that dentistry is not medicine? Dentistry or medicine suggests that it's not the same. I thought medicine was the umbrella term and that dentistry was a branch of medicine. I would, because of my education, I would very much agree with you where it should be, dentistry should be considered as a separate branch or a subdivision of medicine because we are indeed specialists of the mouth, as well as all other ailments of the we head and the Google neck. This. Do you have your phone on you? <laughs> we have to Google what it's <laughs> But I think what I think what you're I also mean, getting at too, Gwen, also stems from the fact that with dentistry, what makes it very unique as a subdivision of healthcare is that the majority of what we do is very surgery based. Let me phrase it this way: mm. Would you say dermatology and medicine? Would you ever say that? Oh, dermatology. Probably not. That okay. dermatology is a division of medicine. But dentist. So what is the? Okay. I, I mean, I think. <laughs> so what I no. So I think you're speaking to the very issue of it, and that it, even in it's crystallized in the different degrees, right? You have doctor of dental medicine versus doctor of dental surgery, or optometry. Like, would you ever say optometry and medicine? Right. So what so is the distinction that, and that, and that says dentistry and medicine? That's the issue. That's the problem. There isn't a distinction, but it has been treated as there is. Correct. That's the crux of the issue is that it should be treated as an extension of your of medicine, like, like opto- podiatry, ophthalmology, dermatology. It's one of the systems of the body that you're looking to treat. So it mm-hmm. should be. The problem is that from the historical context, it never really was. Whereas surgery was pulled in. At some point, dentistry was, but it still is never fully embraced as part of. And that's, and I Bingo. think that's, I, I think, think that's the, the fact thing that, that they have, like, they have the ability to put you under, like, I well, think, like, stick a needle in you and, like, put, well, like, I, numb stuff where you're talking funny for a few well, hours. I mean, and actually, <laughs> that gets me to, me, no, no, no. A doctor then. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And, and in my experience, I've had, more of I've had both the, you know, Dr. Jenny's, but then I've also had this clown here for sure <laughs> in this article, right? Like I've had that jackass that, but that's not unique to just dentistry. And that's so dentistry shouldn't saying. be vilified for it. It's the same thing as any industry where someone has a layer of expertise yeah. that you are, that you are trusting them. They are doing the right thing. But the problem is that we're human, there's human beings involved. And so in that mix of human beings, you get wonderful human beings that are practicing dentistry like Dr. Jenny versus, <laughs> you know, th- like this jackass that was like basically ripping people off for decades. And exactly what I think is, so this is a little bit back to my philosophy classes. Aristotle talks about what it means to live well, and it means to be excellent. And excellence is an activity of reason. And the byproduct is that we all benefit from it. And so I again return to this article is talking about a person who is bad and therefore whatever profession he would have chosen would have been an expression of bad character, which shows the importance of talking about good character. Jenny 
is a good person, which means that whatever profession she chooses, she'll do it. By the way, side note. Side note. Side note. So at CrossFit, (laughs) every once in a while, one of our workouts, you have to do, you know, so many, like 10 rounds of something. Do you know what Jenny does that she got me to do? It's actually a good idea. I love this. You're going to say this. (laughs) Instead of listing out 10 and then crossing it off every time you finish a round, she makes me spell, well, she doesn't make me, she influenced me to spell out optimism. So whenever you're done with a round, you cross mm. out one of those, one of those letters. Yep. See, she's just, she approaches everything, but that's a solid character. And then the expression oh. of that shows itself in other Thank ways. Thank you. You're welcome. That's a good story. I like <laughs> but, but I, I like that you, that you say that because, and you're absolutely right, Gwen, and I, and that's why Thank I, you. I consider this an absolute pleasure and a treat that you invited me on the podcast because we initially were discussing about the article. I figured you would probably come with this kind of approach, but I wouldn't want to sway your opinion to lead to that conclusion, yet you came to that. And that if you were to put me into another industry or actually, to go back to Constantine's talk before, actually, it, to put me in a different profession. See, it's one thing if I'm put into a different industry, but we have to also dis- make the distinction between a career versus a profession because profession specifically is a stipulation of a kind of job where the person who's the professional has their client put their trust in them. Yes. Absolutely. And that's where, that's why in a way it is kind of a backhanded compliment aware this concept of this one bad dentist made the entire industry look bad because it was a betrayal of trust. But it shows how much of an impact that betrayal of trust has made to this author, to this clientele, and in a whole with the entire population for anybody who really was going to read this article and find an impact with it. So it mentions a code of ethics. Is there a specific code of ethics that is different from the Hippocratic Oath, for instance? Or, I mean, what is a dentist's code of ethics as opposed to a medical doctor's code of ethics? Is there a different one? We actually swear the Hippocratic Oath that we would do our patient no harm. So there's not a dentist code of ethics. Correct. You have the exact same code of ethics exact as a same. physician. Yep. All right, there we go. Sounds like some bullshit. I, what do you mean it sounds like some bullshit? I think no, no, smell no. it in the air. I think no, no, no. that is mm. the evidence. No, I mean, it's, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I agree with you. What I'm saying you. is some bullshit that they're basically, everything's the same, yeah. yet... Why is there this separation? That's well. That's what that's what I'm saying. Because I even made a note here. Say a code of ethics, and I just put which is because if that is distinct from a physician's, then I wanted to know. But it is the exact no, same. No, it's the exact same. Okay. So it doesn't make that, that's uh, to my point is like the more we need to move to including dentistry as looking at it as just another, not just but another right. me, medical specialty. What does evidence based dentistry mean? I remember you were going to ask me about that. Yes. Uh, every, okay, so based off of, and this is the most important part about evidence-based dentistry. We talked about this earlier, but evidence-based dentistry, the major crux of it is that the treatment of a patient must be specific to the patient. And on right. that ground, on those grounds, evidence-based dentistry is basically providing the patient their needs based off of, for one, what are they looking for? What we call a cheek complaint. Two, their health we have to get a history from them and that's not only what they've had in the past but all and, and their various risks of getting various uh, dental or oral illnesses but also their overall health my clinical expertise are those of the providing treating dentist and also clinically significant dental research okay. that's basically the entirety of what evidence-based dentistry is it's patient focused It's based off of research that actually is clinically significant, our background, as well as the patient's circumstances. One thing that the article brings out, because while we're on the subject of medical-based dentistry, is that there's this kind of gap in between medical research and what is in the same amount of funding resources that have gone into dental research. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of wanted to get your reaction to that. Like, is that something, is that that a thing, or is he kind of overstating it? What is that look like and as a practitioner. And I'm glad you actually mentioned that because it kind of comes back also to uh, Gwen's 
almost sounding rhetorical question, which actually is a good one, is why is it that dentistry still sounds like it's a separate industry from medicine? Should it be a subpart? Well, one thing I forgot to mention that what that makes dentistry quite unique compared to any other division of surgery is that we have so many different materials to be able to perform our various surgeries. So a lot of that, Constantine, has to do with the cost into research. That's number one. Number two, I would also say is also a problem with the understanding of how to perform oral health services or dentistry for patients. See, a lot of what is unique to us is that our care is what we call elective. So in medicine, a major difference philosophically between between medicine and dentistry, Gwen, is that if, with a lot of medicine, it is a matter of life or death. If you are to get a diagnosis and you are recommended a treatment plan and then you go and proceed through that treatment. Mm-hmm. In a lot of dentistry, or pretty much virtually all of dentistry, is elective, which means you could choose to do something or you choose not to. With the major problems like tooth decay or what we call caries, um, gum diseases, that's gingivitis or periodontitis where you lose bone and gum and the attachment of teeth, or cancer, the big three. It has to go to an extreme point before, or besides, let's forget cancer. Cancer, it's do or die. You better treat it. But that's a very small percentage of patients who ever come in, or the population in general. But with tooth decay and gum disease, it has to come to a point where you have an infection and it's starting to spread to certain parts of the body, especially the number one area you have to make sure it is of life and death to the throat. Mm. Okay. So because there is that problem where a lot of what we do, Constantine, is elective versus do or die, that I think is the crux and problem with a lot of the need for the acquisition of funding. The other also is sadly with the materials, because a lot of what we do, we need these materials, and that's why our industry is very expensive. Mm. Do you think that if it was more brought under the umbrella of medicine... Do you think that would result in additional funding to be able to have to fund better research? I think it can. There are some ways of where um, there are certain forays actually aware there are the abilities to receive grant funding. And that's mostly in the community health realm. And the reason Mm. why is because community health has this better ability to understand from a holistic standpoint and holistic, I mean, not alternative medicine, but to integrate dentistry as a part of the whole. Mm -hmm. It has the ability to be able to learn from various populations of people, well, what puts them at a likely risk? And I think that's where a lot of the innovation and the capability of receiving funding for that kind of research can come from. Other kinds, though, unfortunately, that's where you're going to probably going to fall by the wayside. But that's where the crucial parts are. What is your favorite part of your job? We've gone into (laughs) all the logistics of this, but I'm wondering, what, what do you love about what you do? I mean, from when you started studying and you say, like, you have this, you know, your uncle, is it your uncle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. So your uncle was saying, okay, maybe we should try this. And then you get into it, you do the studying and then you're in the practice of it. What is it about the profession where you think, okay, this is, this is good. This was a good decision. This fits. And I love this. And I love this part of my job. I think there are too many, but I'll narrow it to a few. For one, again, that back to previously where I said that I can be able to relieve somebody instantly of their pain and their grief. That I think is the number one. Number two, I'm glad that my patients really do like me because I know that there's always this stigma where, especially when I treat kids too, because I do family dentistry where I treat the young and the old. Where many come in with their fears and their apprehensions, and that's regardless of age, but then they come out otherwise very happy with me. And to me, I find that very rewarding. If I can get someone who initially is just trembling, and they're out feeling like a million bucks, that's something I really love about my job. That's what I love about my industry, the ability to be able to do that. I also, I'm going to geek here, but I also like the fact that I can play with a lot of various toys, and that there's always going to be innovation. Mm. Many tend to have this concept that things will always stay the same. But honestly, things change. Things change with time, with innovation, with change of attitude, change of the zeitgeist. I believe I I pronounced that correctly. I'm very happy that dentistry has changed from... 50 years ago. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have no complaints. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I think, well, I think this is a good thing. Well, no, I mean, definitely. I think I look back to like, say my dad or his parents' generation. It was like, 
pull them you out. You just pull it out. You just have somebody just, in town who know. has a wrench, and then that's it. You ain't that, baby. Like, that was like dental treatment. Yeah. No, so I am all in favor of modern dentistry. And you, you go ahead and keep working on those on those toys <laughs> and making it all that much easier. I think that that's fantastic. Well, I would imagine that that might be something that is taken for granted with something like this article is that one of the joys of something like dentistry and putting it in the realm of science is that it is something that is not static, that is growing and that is a realm of knowledge that where you can be creative and continue to learn. Absolutely. In fact, there is one quote in the article too. I can't remember what it is word for word, but the, like you said, I mean, there's innovations in dentistry for one, a major one is pain management. Pain management Mm -hmm. is a major one because it used to be that we just had to grin and bear it if we still felt it. Or at the time we had Novocaine for a good deal of the 20th century until we had other local anesthetics like lidocaine. But then the author of the article says that, well, when when the health of the general population got better, that's when we as dentists all of a sudden started to develop other services like teeth whitening, veneers, other cosmetic care. But it was a, it almost felt snide to me because it's not that we had to find and innovate other ways to make a buck or two. It's rather we had to up our ante to fulfill a demand. It initially was what we call palliative treatment. How do you get a patient out of pain? How do you relieve them of their grief? But now it can go instead of, well, patients are now more educated about what they can do to prevent these problems. And that's the key here is the prevention part. Mm. Things are getting better to make sure that people not only are well informed on how to take better care of things, but also prevent future problems. And again, it's about that misconception of stagnance, that things stay the same. We never stay the same. We age, we change. Then it's, okay, well, I'm no longer in pain, but I notice this gap between my teeth. Now we have more developed ways and methods to be able to close the gap. Should we consider braces for you? Do you have the right uh, gums and do you have good hygiene? Or do you have a muscle that separates the two teeth? Maybe we have to trim that muscle back. Well, it's what we call a phrenectomy. Well, if you don't want to go through either of those, do we want to maybe bond some white fillings on there to seal the gap? Or do you want to go for veneers? We are given this great opportunity with all these innovations, and it all comes from research and development and also a lot of clinical trial and error to be able to provide these to our, to patients and the general public versus it's only deal with the pain, get them out of there, and then you're just going to have to grin and bear with the teeth that God gave you. If you look at the stigma attached to poor looking teeth, right? Like so much emphasis, your smile, you have a great smile. If you have a good smile, you hear that compliment all the time. Oh, your smile, your smile, your smile. The converse is if you don't, it's like, hmm. And there could be stigma attached to it. I mean, even beyond just- It's an economic thing. It could be an economic, right? Like, oh, you must be broke. You can't fix your teeth. Mm, What's happening there, right? And so- Well, that's why I've heard a lot of dentists doing charity work for- for organizations where people are trying to go back out into the workforce and the dentists will donate their time to help with their teeth, which I think is amazing. amazing. Yeah, it is. On Constantine's point, it was even found with the um, the NIH that depending upon where you are in the federal poverty line, that your risk of having decayed, missing, or filled teeth can even triple depending upon what degree you are from the federal poverty line. And For that reason, one, that's why a lot of dentists do devote their time to a lot of charity work. I know even our state dental association, the California Dental Association, offers at least annually, if not twice annually, a day or an entire weekend that can provide same-day services for those who can otherwise not afford to go to a private dentist. That's awesome. Especially because, again, like I said, with one of the major disparities with my line of work, unfortunately, is that because a lot of the materials that we need to be able to provide these services are so expensive, that's why our care is so expensive. Right. But we do need to, in return, give back to those who otherwise could not afford it. Okay. That that actually raises a point or, or something I want to explore a little bit more is that the, how it affects like this in terms around, based around socioeconomics, but... If you look at certain communities that are underrepresented, African-American, Latino, those of lower um, socioeconomic status, HIV patients, and how that actually can affect their lives. And you think connecting it back to the medical, like, you know, you have medical insurance, 
if you need major, say you're ending get like on Medicare or Medi-Cal, and you need some, you know, your knee goes out, they fix your knee up because it can affect your, you know, some things are, you know, you can't get certain elective surgeries, but things are a lot more is covered, say, than from like a Medi-Cal perspective for dentistry, right? Mm-hmm. If we were treating dentistry more as traditional medicine, and it should be because the effects that it does have, yeah, maybe you're not going to kill over per se, but you can in some cases, but it does have such a profound effect on your life that the fact that we don't cover it in the same way as we do other medical, meaning that this separation now causes us to not also fund it in the same way from a public perspective, right? And that's a policy thing. Mm -hmm. We don't put as much money into dentistry for the public as we would say for other medical treatments. And so we let folks mouths basically fall apart while yeah we may treat their body in much more thoroughly in, in many cases that kind of connection between how not that separation can have a profound effect even on policy and how we cover it which then I ultimately so. if you're looking at communities of color being able to go out and get jobs or be part of forward moving society you're further locked out if, if you don't have the money to afford dental care right imagine two people who are equally qualified for a job and they walk into a job interview and one has stunning teeth and one's i mean it's that a would... wrap for you you will not be getting that job <laughs> were, forget about it it's over like, a bit more the most okay, you knew exactly where i was going and you were like it's done i mean it, didn't even have to it's, think about but it. It, it's similar to because the experience what, of it, oh, i'm sorry one thing is that's troubling for me is that it seems to reduce dentistry to cosmetic, which it is not. No. Because what it, while that seems cosmetic, and maybe that's why the public perception is treating it like it's cosmetic, but actually it's an indication of somebody's economic and overall wellness, right? Yes, I think on that point. And then the other side of that too is if it's the same thing while we have laws like around ADA, like, you know, ADA, ADA while, we, while we have the ADA, if someone walks in that's, that's disabled, they are going to automatically, no matter, they have such a less opportunity of getting a job, right? Oh, so I see what you mean. You okay. see, so like, so for example, you know. Well, teeth would not be put in the same. Would not be, but they, yeah. but they should be. And that's the point that I'm making is that that is such a profound effect on I look at, like, for example, I've been in the situation where I've called, talked to someone on the phone and said, hey, I want this job. And, you know, this is when I was a young man. I was trying to work at a movie theater. Actually, the Beverly, Beverly Center Theater, your manager <laughs> Do we need back to in 94. No. I re- this is what happened. This is getting edited out. Okay. But I'm just <laughs> saying it happened. This happened. No. My name is Constantine Hatcher. Right, so they figured and I'm, I'm educated. I know, how to, I know how to code switch. That's a topic for another podcast. But so on the phone, you can't necessarily decipher that I'm an African-American man. I'm an African-American man for the podcast. <laughs> <world>. <laughs> um, <laughs> FYI. Sorry. No, but, and so I show up to the, you know, the, yeah, we're hiring. We got plenty of spots. Come on down. You know, yeah, I'm a college. I was going to Boston University. Hey, hey. Terry, go Terriers. Um, you know, you're I'm small, here for a summer job. <laughs> I come down and later that day, oh, oh we don't have any jobs. We're, we, there's no jobs available. We filled all our positions. Sorry. Did Clearly, you, I mean. Did you show them your teeth? <laughs> it <laughs> might have been my. Did you smile? That could have been the problem. No, no but I mean, and, and it was, and it was like you know, it wasn't. You could see the body language and like the face turn when they realized that this is the Constantine Hatcher that I talked to on the phone, and this is not who I pictured, and this mm-hmm. is not who I want in working for me. And now we're talking about a movie theater job. It's not necessarily the best job in the world. But the point being is that that happens across the spectrum. So when I, when you think about teeth, and yes, yes, it could be cosmetic. Well, so well, could my black skin. The, exactly. you, know, you know, It's yeah, really no, not no, cosmetic. It's actually how we perceive people I'm, and how yeah. you're going to be offered opportunity. Yeah. Or even a subset on that discussion, too, about the disparities, too, between anyone who is marginalized and is unfortunately falling through the cracks with receiving care, Constantine. Let me give you a little bit of a story. So when I was in my previous job with treating HIV patients, at the time we were only uh, accepting patients who were grant eligible, meaning that they are uh, within several degrees of the federal poverty line, that they are either uninsured or underinsured through DentaCal, the Medicaid system. 
So one gentleman who I treated, who was a very nice patient, he had become gainfully employed. So it was a bittersweet farewell because on the one hand, I am happy for him that he got a job, which means that he therefore is gainfully employed. And also through his employment, he received dental insurance. But we more than gladly, um, when we dismissed him as a patient, but with good reason, uh, we offered to transfer his chart at no cost to him whatsoever. And that's not only the chart information, but also his x-rays. Then he heartbreakingly calls us when we ask, oh, is everything okay? Because we thought he was calling us to request a chart. He says, no, unfortunately, he ha- he was trying to um, make an appointment. He had an HMO plan through his job. An HMO plan, if you're not familiar, it assigns you with a dentist who is a provider through that coverage. So his assigned dentist had asked him a few questions. And by the way, this is all in the state of California. The dentist had somehow asked a question or the, his uh, staff on the other line asked, if the patient had any medical conditions to disclose. So my patient was very upfront and honest and said, I am HIV positive, but I have my HIV well control. So she then tells him that their facility could not provide him treatment or care because it is not equipped to provide him services. Oh, wow. That's a Bullshit. The only reason that I could not treat any patient who is medically complicated is if their medical complications are not being taken care of by a medical doctor to a degree of where I can safely provide them services without them leaving in a stretcher or in, or any degree to that. Oh, wait, okay, wait, wait. So if somebody has a medical condition and they cannot take care of that... I would not see them. Wow. And the reason, Gwen, is is one major thing I always make abundantly clear to my patients, and I will tell you too, my philosophy is this. If you two were my patients, I don't treat your teeth, I don't treat your gums. I treat you. I treat the things attached to you. I I treat you and care for you as a person. Mm -hmm. And your needs should be tailored to what you were looking for, what you ask of me, as well as what I see that you may not be aware of. Right. I had asked you after reading this, have you seen people who have been overtreated? And you responded, yes. What is your, what is your reaction to that? Is it on an x-ray? When is it that you see somebody has been overtreated and then do you break it to them? Or what do you say? What do you do? Well, the times of where I can see and conclude that someone's been overtreated usually is when there is a time apart from when I saw a patient last and then the latest time, the most recent time I get to see them. And then sometime in between, they probably saw somebody else for whatever reason. I don't take offense to it. But then if I see that there's a major change, but then I know my patient and I know that something should not have changed otherwise, then I can draw that conclusion. Okay, something is amiss. That's when I can conclude that there's overtreatment. I can't draw a conclusion like that without first knowing a patient in the past, So the subjects of the article, the dentist who discovered the order of treatment of his patients could discover this because he had the charts and the history of the patients. So those are the times where I was able to see that there was over treatment because I've known the history of my patients, but then otherwise they've gone to someplace else, come back to me. All of a sudden we take x-rays, do a routine checkup. And then I look and say, wait, so you got all of this done? Yeah. Hmm. And if nothing had otherwise significantly changed, like... They didn't all of a sudden start taking Adderall or developed a meth addiction, or they didn't all of a sudden have a diet consisting of nothing but lemonade and Coca-Cola and a whole lot of sugar. Like, yeah, if nothing major like that changed, otherwise Uh everything's been same old, that's when I, then uh, it raises a red flag. The other kind of abuse that I've also heard of too with patients from other dentists, unfortunately, is a scam where there are dentists where their practice is where they would provide, they would incentivize a patient to pay the entire cost of their treatment plan. So the entire plan of what they've been recommended based off of what, what has been observed. If they pay it all up front, they can get a 5% discount or 10% discount and maybe like a free, um, a free whitening at the end of it. They would pay the entire balance up front but no service has ever been rendered. Wow. I've heard that practice before too. I've had a couple of patients who unfortunately have been victims of that. So that brings me to my next question. This article suggests that dentistry is particularly susceptible to the business end of it, that the way in which it is structured, that greed seems like almost an inevitable (laughs) <laughs> Wait, what, what is the an inevitable charm or what do I want to say that maybe even somebody does go into it with 
good intentions, but the possibility of money alters all of that. It's an inevitable lore. Yeah, there we go. That's what this suggests. But don't all medical doctors, though, make money from procedures and from patients? True. Again, it comes, it stems back to the major difference between dentistry versus medicine is that a lot of our services that we provide are with that instant gratification. So we have to have a lot of materials to be able to provide those services. So... To give you an idea, let, w- let me talk about what goes through setting up a chair for either of you two if you were to be a patient. So like Constantine, if I were to set you up to do a filling, we not only have to prepare the room where we disinfect the chair and all surfaces that I would touch, like the overhead light, my tray, mm. um, a countertop where we would place our materials, but we also have to put barriers on them so that way we don't have to double wipe it. We also would have to sterilize our instruments. We have to use water. That water costs something. The time devoted to sterilize that costs something. The instruments themselves cost something. The filling material that I would choose to use on you, especially the bonding or even what holds that, they all cost something. Every single little thing that we do costs something. On top of that, we also sadly have to pay into liability insurance. And insurance liability basically is that, God help me if I were to ever harm you, but if I were to, I have to answer to a higher authority. So that way you would be uh, compensated for my misdeeds. But then I would have to have that kind of coverage on my end. Unfortunately, that has to be reflective in the cost of the services. It's like going to the dentist is, a, is basically a surgery. Wanna, it is. <laughs> Excuse me. Very wanna, much is. I want to go through some myths. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Myth busting. Myth time. Do we need to go in for a cleaning twice a year? I would say at least once. Okay, at least once. But. <laughs> There's a but in there. But. Uh, one misconception here, or rather a, um, a, fal- a logical fallacy with the article, is that the author actually clearly states that he, as a young child, it was ingrained in him that he would go twice a year. And then he thought that he would have to follow the same guidelines as an adult. Well, the reason why we would ingrain it in children is because children are at a much higher risk of getting tooth decay and various problems. And also they are minors, so they're under the supervision of their parents. So the parents have to be the ones who are responsible to bring them to the care. The other thing, too, also is that kids are actually likely, if they don't have their their oral problems resolved, they can actually lose time from school. So it is a mandate from the state to have them seen, if not once a year, twice a year. So that's why the frequency is so high. Now, the American Dental Association actually stated that the frequency is determined by the dentist. I would say, in general, the average person probably should be seen at least annually, because for one... We change, we age, things are different. And that's everything, not only from us getting older, but when we eventually have various health problems, those problems as well as the medications that we need in order to take care of that can influence things. Things like behavior, like what we eat or drink, whether we breathe more in our mouths or even our exercising like our CrossFit, that has a lot to do, a lot of influence with our oral health. So that's where a lot of that plays in with the frequency. So I can charge uh, Drew at CrossFit Pendulum for my dental care? Is that what we're saying? I plead the fifth on that. (laughs) Okay. All right. Uh, Crest White Strips, are we a fan or no? Honestly, Crest White Strips are fine. Okay. All right. Uh, mouthwash. But do they really list- work? Let's, let's get to the bottom of the situation. <laughs> sure. I'm do some, anything, didn't you ever have any question? We can do them all right here. I mean, all let's right, go. We've got, we've got some questions. So, all right. Wait, what did you say? Do they really work? Yes. Okay. Do they, is that like a thing? Or is it like, sometimes I'm, there's like so many products out there like, oh, this, whiten your teeth. You know, like how much of it, like other, many other things, right? Like how much of it is real or how much of it is like, hmm, is that some bullshit? And I like that you asked that, Constantine, for a very good reason. To answer it, let me give you one specific uh, definition here. We have to establish that bleaching uh, for the teeth is a drug. A drug is a substance that your body takes somehow, whether you apply it or you to ingest it, it is injected, whether through the muscles or through the um, veins and the arteries, and it creates an effect on the body. So like if you were to get a headache and you were to buy ibuprofen, Advil, that's a certain small dose of ibuprofen, and it won't influence your head the way that you think or your coordination, so you can buy it over the counter. But if it's super strong or you need maybe a narcotic to go with it to make it take better effect, then you need a prescription for that. 
So with the bleaching that's found in the Crest Pro uh, Pro Whitening Strips, that's a small dosage of carbon peroxide. That's a kind of peroxide that's actually milder than hydrogen peroxide like you would get from a bottle. So if it's if you can purchase it without a prescription or by a dentist, it's because it's a low enough dose where the effect can be mild or can work well enough, but depends on how clean your teeth are when you first play it on, as well as the teeth themselves, can they easily receive them, as well as also the kinds of teeth. If you have gray teeth, which thankfully neither of you has gray teeth, unfortunately, that kind of whitening would not work. You would need something else. You would okay. need uh, veneering. But for like super bright as bright white as the paper or the box on our table here, that would usually have to be by a professional, by a dentist. Or that person you probably saw with super white teeth on TV or in ads, it's either because it's been photoshopped or you're probably looking at a really good cosmetic job with veneers. Something that has been permanently fixed on there, not because a gel has been applied to your teeth for a few minutes at a time. Hopefully that answers it. (laughs) That does. That's a big trend, though. Is it, you know, okay, the major oh, yeah. white tooth. Is there really a highly recommended dentist toothpaste or mouthwash? Remember how the, they would say, like, four <laughs> out of five dentists say use this? All right, so what's the truth? <laughs> what is the truth? Yeah. What's the best one? Okay, what I learned in dental school yes. from a really good professor, Dr. Kelleher, is that when you're asked a general question, you answer with a proper answer, two-word answer, and that two-word answer is, it depends. <laughs> now, okay. in, in terms of toothpaste, I'll start with that. I, it depends upon the patient's needs, and I usually would say a good general staple for what you're looking for in a toothpaste is that, for one, it has fluoride of some kind, because fluoride, like we discussed before with fluoridated water, it works better as a topical drug, that it is applied to teeth, that it's brushed against when the teeth are cleaned. And what I also tell patients is look for that American Dental Association ADA seal of approval on there, because the ADA is actually an independent research group as well. They actually have their own researchers and lab technicians who actually have to test a lot of these products on the market to make sure that they are safe for use and they actually are meant for their intended purposes. So if they have that seal, you're using a good product. If you have another need, like say for me, I have sensitive teeth because I was an idiot back when I was a kid and I used a medium and hard brush because I thought the harder you brush, the better you clean. But as we're finding out, it's the way that you brush and you need a softer brush so you don't hurt the gums. I use Sensodyne because it has a key ingredient, potassium nitrate, that helps to desensitize the teeth. Okay. So it really depends upon the person, but I would say look for that ADA seal of approval. You can't go wrong with that toothpaste. With mouthwash, we're finding more and more that there are certain ones on the market that just freshen your breath, but then there are other ones that they're very few aware they actually can do a good job. A good classic staple for gum disease or with gingivitis where you got puffy, bloody, painful gums, Ew. I would go with Listerine. <laughs> That's my grandparents. <laughs> oh. oh, but About there's... that Listerine life. But they have better flavors. There, there are. Instead of like just the do they original, work the same. Is they all do all the flavors of Listerine work the same? Like, can you go mint Listerine, and, which is not as brutal you're, as the regular Listerine? Oh, like, absolutely. I'm a little uh, traumatized. Hey, Constantine, I call the original <laughs> flavor gasoline flavor for a reason because it looks and tastes like gasoline. But there are some changes with Listerine. A couple major ones. For one, there are the different mint ones, just like Owen was saying. The bigger one, though, see, what makes Listerine such a wonderful mouthwash is that it has essential oils in them, plant-based oils from thyme, eucalyptus, and mint that actually are clinically proven to help reduce the symptoms of gingivitis, the puffy, bloody, painful gums, and to help heal faster. Problem, though, was it's near, it's a little over 40 proof for the original formula. It's actually 21% alcohol, and alcohol is a major risk of oral cancer. So there is a zero alcohol formula. So thankfully, you got the benefits of the essential oils without the alcohol in it. But I promise you guys, I am not paid by (laughs) by what I'm going to say next. But there was a recent thing I did that I found, and it's all thanks to Instagram. There was a colleague of mine. Um, his name's Ryan Nolan. And Ryan, if you're hearing this, hi. (laughs) He's a he's a research dentist who actually developed a mouthwash that's quite innovative. It's called Nano Silver, and that's the one I actually use because, for one, he pitches the fact that it's only got five ingredients in it. Most mouthwashes you see, there are multiple ingredients, but it's just only a few natural ones. Um, Let me see if I can count them. There's 
The silver itself, xylitol, there's calcium in it, water, and a fragrance of some kind of flavoring. And the beauty of this mouthwash is that while most mouthwashes are acidic, and we discovered that acid is the major cause of tooth decay. Okay. Germs cause it, but it's the acid that it creates from eating sugars that we eat mm -hmm. and we leave behind from not brushing or flossing. Does that depend on the type of sugar? It does. Like what if it's sugar from a kiwi as opposed to, let's say, a Snickers bar? Ah, uh, see, that's a that's a trick question there. The kiwi sugar, the fructose itself, wouldn't cause, uh, wouldn't be the, the fuel for it. But the tartness, tartness is actually acid. So mm -hmm. it can turn otherwise pretty mild germs that wouldn't do anything, if it's found in a right acidic environment in the mouth, it will become a tooth decay causing germ. Okay. Combine that more with the the kind of sugars that create starch and that these germs do feast off of are from starch. Right. That's the backbone for plaque and that's the environment that not only these germs live on, almost like a coral reef, but they eat and they lay waste from the sugar. Mm -hmm. So where they eat is basically where they, yeah. I'm gonna to try to keep the language nice here, <laughs> but you can. I just you have can... a picture of germs dropping feces in my mouth. Wait! Oh my god! Well, that's exactly what it is, and this that's is... why I try to tell patients oh why you god. want to keep your mouth clean because they they eat where they do that. That was but... nice. That was well, nice. it gives the term doo doo breath" a whole new I mean, meaning, <laughs> right? It's a literal term now. I did not know it was literal. Like when <laughs> someone says, "Damn, your breath smells like shit," it literally does. Okay. So what he was trying to Yeah, that's okay. But back to the mouthwash show. Like most mouthwashes, they're either meant to freshen your breath or like with Listerine, they are to help with symptoms of gum disease or gingivitis, or they're ones that have fluoride in to help fight against tooth decay and to remineralize. The problem is, is that in order for them to stay in a bottle for a long period of time on a shelf, they have to be acidic. It's preservative. Mm. So it can stay on the shelf for a long period of time. The problem though is simple. By the time that you're using it in the mouth and you use it for frequent periods at a time, your mouth's not supposed to be acidic. It's supposed to be neutral. Mm. It's supposed to be neither basic uh, or alkaline or acidic. But if it runs more to the acidic side, that's when you're leaning more to the loss of tooth. So with this mouthwash, it actually helps to neutralize it and also helps remineralize the teeth. And my favorite part is it stops plaque from building on the teeth. Okay. So that would be one major one I would recommend is Nano Silver. All right. Now, is he the only one that makes the Nano Silver product? That's his or brand. It, that's Correct. His, that's his jam. Because not only is it a product that he himself developed, but the coating for the Nano Silver is actually proprietary. Mm. I'm about to give me some nano silver. <laughs> Again, stop stop this. I am not paid Father's by Day. him to say this, but you can actually buy it on Father's Amazon Day. Prime. There really? Okay, some Father's Day, I guess. I need to stop I this so. mouth pooping that's going the on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There is one other mouthwash I can recommend that does not have any sort of commercial backing to it whatsoever. And you'll laugh, but it is effective and it's decades old. Warm salt water rinse. <coughs> ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it's I an acquired you're just taste. You're supposed to do that when you have a cold <coughs> or a cough. <laughs> <laughs> How apropos. Okay, another question. So mm -hmm. my dentist says that I grind my teeth, and I choose to take this as a compliment because I'm a deep thinker. Is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> what am I supposed to think about that? Well, on the one hand, the compliment thought is right. Okay. I myself also grind my teeth too, and it stems from stress. And a lot of what we initially thought was all grinders basically are dealing with some sort of mental or psychological stress. But that's only <laughs> that <laughs> now we're just. <laughs> did you did you finish? What did you have? It was a grape. You I had, had a grape. No, I I tried to eat too many nuts at once. <laughs> oh, it was the nuts. <laughs> that sounds. <laughs> Maybe it was the rosemary. That's what it is. It's the, <laughs> well, the rosemary went down the wrong pipe. Mm -mm. Okay. You poor man. I have pooping nuts in my mouth problems. It's, <laughs> it sounds it's, it's so it's, vile. You know what? This is taking a, a really <laughs> bad I, turn here. We're taking a turn. Do a dark it turn. Explicit for this. this <laughs> <laughs> Who knew you would have to have explicit for it? Ask a dentist. That's the. I think that's going to be the show title. So I could ask a dentist. Yeah. Now it should just be. 
No, it's okay. I'm, you know what? With my Instagram account, I'm kind of used to this anyway. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, you know what? We're we're talking to a professional who has a career. Um, have you have you checked what I've been posting in stories lately? <laughs> so, um, one thing that I find fascinating with Instagram is the advertising that I get in feeds all the time. And I created this series called Ad Feed Friday on my story. So where I show actual screenshots of real ads that I get in my feed to Ooh, see. What do you get? I get everything from really cool, fascinating products that are promoted through Instagram to just really weird advertisements. But the funniest ones of all are the very sexually obscene or overt ads. And I created what was like um, known as Tits McGee. It was like a reference from Anchorman. Uh -huh. So I would usually get some sort of ad with a girl who's very booksomely who's trying to promote a product. So I'm not the type of person who's going to say, oh my God, it's a girl with big boobs. No, I understand that sex sells. It's something that's very understood. But I am the type that also thinks you can't over-sexualize the advertisement or else you lose sight of what the product is. Right. You have a bad ad. Mm -hmm. So I created the series of, well, here's where it went way over the top and here's why the ad doesn't make sense. So like, <laughs> That's great. Don't, you don't have to give crap to Constantine because I, uh -huh. I put a whole lot worse on my ad feed. Although See? I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit jealous. Why am I not getting sexy ads? Uh, Sorry, I will please. say this. If um, if you block anything, then you're not going to get those ads anymore. I do the opposite one where I actually try to look for some <laughs> of this stuff. Or Instagram's clever enough. If they, if they discover that I have screenshot something, their algorithm understands that I found interest in it. And it doesn't matter if it's good or bad interest. I was interested. Mm. Then they send oh, me wow. more. So um, a lot of the ads I was trying to show in Ad Feed Friday that are over-sexualized is in the dental industry. And that's what I'm trying to focus on is when is it appropriate and where does it draw the line? Mm. Okay. And, and it's because I've been screenshotting a whole lot of this. That's why... You're candid or small them. direct club is just sending me more of these ads and i'm like dudes That's keep awesome. bringing it you're giving me more content you're giving me more material i i'm just i'm just happy you know and and it, just well, oh i'm sorry Go no ahead. i was just gonna say and it proves that dentistry is much more sexy than philosophy you know what excuse you <laughs> i don't know I, I find it kind of sexy to talk about deep, profound thoughts or discussions or debates. But that's just me, though. I mean, t there are others who want to kind of talk or debate. It's exciting. I mean, I find that's one of the reasons behind the podcast is that I, I really enjoy having these kinds of conversations. And I just wanted to, you know, put it out there and let other people enjoy the conversations. But one of the things that I was really happy when you said yes to coming on was that like I said, this article is about dentistry, but it seems like it's about a much broader picture about professional ethics. Oh, it is. Yeah. Just to remind everyone how they can get you on Instagram at Jenny V underscore DMD. Okay. Correct. Yay. Jenny B. All right. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for having me. <laughs> this has been great. This has been awesome. Thank okay. you, Dr. Jenny. Thank well, you, This has Dr. been a real treat, guys. <laughs> If you have any questions, there is an email. It's good as in the details pod at gmail.com. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. The learnings in the details.